Hello everyone, this is the second video in my series where we are incrementally building up a drone tracking radar. So in each video, I'll bring up a new radar topic and then use real radar hardware and software to accomplish that principle. Each topic will build on the previous video's topic so that by the end of this video series, it will all come together into this very classical range Doppler plot. Here I'm just tracking cars and bicycles, but in the final video, we'll be tracking the range and speed of a small drone. Last week, we talked about four hardware options to construct this radar. If you haven't seen that video, then I'd recommend you pause this video and start there. But here's a recap of those four options. So option one was the very novel MIT Cantena. I'll post the link so that you can check that one out. And these prices are all just my best guess at what the components would cost. Uh, and the prices are in US dollars. Option two was the Pluto software defined radio. This can do two channel transmit, two channel receive, but it's limited to about 30 megahertz of instantaneous bandwidth. Option three added an external LO to facilitate stretch processing. This gives us much greater bandwidth and the mixers allow us to operate at really whatever frequency that we want. And then finally, option four was the phaser kit, which combines all the features along with phase rate beamforming. This is the one that I'll be using in these videos, but you can take all the stuff that we're going to do in this video series and apply it to any one of these other options, just with varying degrees of performance and features. And there are even other hardware option choices too. Uh, in the comments, I've talked with people about using the Hack RF1, which is a great SDR. With the phaser though, I can do all the things that I want to show in this video series, as well as have some cool stuff to explore if people want to see more of these kinds of videos uh, in the future. But all the concepts and even much of the software that we're gonna go through is very applicable to many different hardware setups. So in the last video, we briefly discussed Pulse versus CW radar. I wanna go a little deeper into both of those now. Everything in this series is going to be CW radar, but to understand these concepts, I think it actually makes more sense to first start with pulsed radar. It'll allow me to introduce some key topics like the radar range equation and range resolution. And I think it will naturally explain why we're doing the continuous wave radar implementation. So we'll talk about pulsed radar and then segue into how CW radar works. And we'll calculate Doppler shifts and then we'll program the phaser as a simple CW radar and we'll see all that working. And after we see it working, I'll go over exactly what is happening in the Python program. So we'll go over that in detail and spend some time on it. And the software is really the key to building a radar system. Nowadays, choosing and assembling the hardware is not too, too difficult. It's really the software and the data processing that makes a radar a radar. So that's the plan for this video. Um, and let's start now by thinking a bit more about pulsed radar. So pulsed radar works exactly as you would think that radar works. When you think of a radar, you're probably thinking of pulsed radar. In pulsed radar systems, you emit a pulse and then measure its return time, then multiply that time by the speed of light and divide by two because you measured the, the, uh, the round trip time, and that's how you get range. And we can get the velocity of the target by either looking at the change in range from pulse to pulse, or we can measure the Doppler shift of the return pulse, but that is primarily for very fast velocities. And this all works great. There is nothing wrong with it. It is entirely perfect, except for one crippling issue. And the main issue with pulsed radar is that it uses pulses. And to understand why this is a problem, we need to talk a bit about the radar range equation. This is a common version of the classical radar range equation, and it applies to all radar types. Uh, let's, let's walk through it real quickly. This equation is saying that the power we will get back from a target is a function of the transmitted energy, Okay, that, that makes sense. It's also a function of the gain of the receive and transmit antennas, basically how much of that energy we can put in the direction that we want. And here we're assuming that the transmit antenna is the same as the receive antenna. That's why it's G squared. Next, the power we get back is also a function of the wavelength squared uh, of our carrier frequency. So lower frequencies are larger wavelengths, and so they will generally give us more radar range. The radar cross-section is a model of how much energy we expect to get back from a target. Uh, and of course, this varies wildly. And then on the denominator of the equation, you'll see that power diminishes with an R to the fourth loss. So an R squared reduction getting to the target and then another R squared reduction coming back. So it is a whopping R to the fourth total reduction in power, which is absolutely massive. So when you look at this equation, a lot of this is out of our control. We'll make the antennas as good as we can. The wavelength is generally dictated by other factors. Uh, the cross-section is what it is. So the two key points I want to make are, number one, the return power drops like a rock. It's a one over R to the fourth power relationship. That is a huge issue for all radars to overcome. And then number two, the only real knob that we have for that return power is to increase the transmit power. 
And that is average power. It is not peak power. So that's a problem when you're pulsing your transmit waveform. But you might say, well, I, it's okay. I'll, I'll just do really long pulses. Then I'll get a lot of average power on a target. But the problem with really long pulses is range resolution. So let's talk about that next. So if you had two closely spaced objects, like two cars that were only a few meters apart, and you sent it a long radar pulse, then it's very likely that the radar pulse of the yellow car will overlap the radar pulse of the purple car. It's because with just a few meters of separation, the pulses will only be separated in time by a fraction of a microsecond. But if that transmit pulse was shorter, like really short, then you would be able to see a distinct return from the yellow car and a distinct return from the purple car. So that's range resolution. How close can two targets be before we start seeing them as one big target? And of course, there's an equation for range resolution, and of course, it is dependent on pulse width. So the range resolution is equal to the pulse width times the speed of light divided by two. And here's another point that I want to make right now. The bandwidth of a pulse is equal to the reciprocal of its pulse width. So we can rewrite range resolution in terms of bandwidth. This equivalency doesn't really matter right now, but this equation is going to be very important when we start talking about modulating transmit waveforms. So short transmit pulses or high transmit bandwidth will give better range resolution. Let's try an example with either of these equations now. So if we had a one microsecond pulse width, then we will get about 150 meters of range resolution. So if we wanted to see a 1.5 meter difference between the cars, we need a pulse width that is 100 times smaller. So that pulse width needs to be less than 10 nanoseconds. And we can do that. We can make a super short pulse. But now our average transmit power is reduced. So we need to increase the peak power. So for fine range resolution, we end up needing an enormous amount of power for an incredibly short amount of time. It's just a really hard thing to do. Now, keep in mind that I'm only talking about the unmodulated pulsed radar case. There are other waveform types that help with this using a technique called pulse compression, but that will come up in, in later videos. So right now, just consider a pulse sine wave, no modulation to it. And the kind of amplifiers used to transmit that kind of pulse sine wave are absolutely nutty. They are not the kind of amplifiers that we are going to be using. These things generate like 20 kilowatt peak power pulses, but at such a tiny pulse width that they are only about 20 watts of average power. Or they generate like 10 megawatt pulses with a 100 watt average power. So it's enormous peak powers for super tiny amounts of time. It means that a pulsed unmodulated radar is a very hard thing to do a demo for. But I wanted to cover it because it explains a few of the reasons why continuous wave radar is so attractive. So let's talk about that now, continuous wave radar. And a big part of radar, and specifically CW radar, is this idea of Doppler frequency. So let's do a quick refresher on it now. RF waves, as they bounce off a moving target, will shift in frequency. So if an object is coming towards you, it will shift higher in frequency. If it's moving away from you, it will shift lower in frequency. And we usually don't care what the exact frequency is, we only care what the beat frequency is. The beat frequency is the difference between what you transmitted and what you received. And that beat frequency is equal to two times the velocity of the target times the transmitter frequency divided by the speed of light. So we can make our radar using this principle. If we hit a target with a continuous sine wave at one frequency, we will get back a small shift in that frequency. That small shift is the beat frequency, and so we can use that to measure a target's velocity. But what about range? With a single unmodulated sine wave, we can't make any range measurements. Even so, the CW radar is still useful because everything that is stationary relative to the radar will return the same frequency. Only things that are moving will return different frequencies. So this gives us a great ground clutter suppression mechanism. And it's often used for that purpose, like for a police radar gun. So let's go through an example of this now. Say a, a car's velocity is 100 miles per hour headed straight at us. That means that we would see a beat frequency of about 716 hertz. If we change the frequency to instead be 10 gigahertz, then that beat frequency would increase proportionally to about three kilohertz. So these are not huge shifts in frequency, but even a small shift in frequency is very measurable. Over the last 100 years, we've gotten very, very good at measuring frequency. So let's try that now with the phaser setup that we talked about last week. Here's what that setup will look like for measuring CW Doppler shift. I want to say that I first saw the CW radar experiment done with a fan by a brilliant engineer named Luigi Cruz. So I'll put a link to his YouTube video in here also. He used the GNU radio program and a Lime SDR to do his experiment. For us, we'll use the phaser board that we talked about in the last video, and it's connected via Ethernet to my laptop.
and I'm transmitting a 10 gigahertz continuous sine wave. That strikes a fan and then gets reflected to the receiver array. To simplify things, we're not doing any beam forming on the receive side of the phaser board. The array is just pointed straight ahead. So that receive signal comes back into phaser, we compare receive to transmit, and we get the beat frequency. You can find all the details on this lab as well as the program at the GitHub link shown. Let me show you how this works first, and then we'll walk through the program and explain how to do it. So I've got the phaser set up with a transmit antenna. I'm controlling the fan speed with remote control. The top plot is the instantaneous frequency spectrum, and the bottom plot is that frequency spectrum plotted versus time, where the colors indicate the magnitude of that frequency. So there's a big yellow spike at the center of that plot. That's our transmit frequency. And as the fan speed increases, the return frequency moves away from that center. That's the aqua blue trace. That frequency deviation is the beat frequency. So we can take that frequency deviation and use that to derive the fan speed. The numbers might be a little bit hard to see, but um, at the most, it, that frequency deviation is about 250 hertz. It's a very simple radar, very easy to do with just about any hardware. Let's look now at the software for how this is set up and programmed. This is the Python program that I just ran to do that CW radar experiment with the fan. The program is on the GitHub link that I just shared, so you can take a look at it there. It just starts with this standard legalese boilerplate, and then we come to these import commands. So the key library is this ADI library. That is the Pi ADI IAO library that has ADI's data converters, transceivers, synthesizers, and other software controllable parts in it. So this is the key library that will allow us to control all the phaser hardware. And it's the same library that you would use if you did hardware options two or three. There's a video I did for this channel last year that showed how to use this library for Pluto. I'll put the link in, in this video's description. And if you're new to Python and controlling ADI hardware, that might be the, the best place to start uh, with some of this. Then there's some other libraries that we also import, pretty standard libraries. A lot of them are just used, like the PyQt libraries are just used for, for generating the GUI, which unfortunately is, is a lot of this code. So when you start getting into the, the meat of things here, there's two IP addresses. One is the Raspberry Pi IP address. And you know the Raspberry Pi has some IP address, 192.168 point something point something based on where it is on my local network. But you can also assign it a name. And so all of the phasers are called uh, phaser. And so if you just search for phaser.local and you give it that IP address, then, then that will work when we instantiate that uh, Raspberry Pi object. And then the same thing for the uh, SDR IP address. This is Pluto's default address. You could also use Pluto.loco, but I find that using this 192.168.2.1 address works better for consistently controlling Pluto. You can change this IP address if you go into the Pluto config settings, if you want to make that something different, or if you had two Plutos on your, on your network. And then we create the objects. So there's two objects that we're going to create. One is called MySDR. This is, this is Pluto. And the other one is called my phaser, and this is the phaser hardware object that's going to have the ADR1000 and the ADI4159. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use that ADI library to configure the ADR1000s. So we put them in receive device mode because that is what that array is. It's a receive only array. And then we load gain and phase cals. There's descriptions on how the calibration works if you go to wiki.analog.com slash phaser. So there's some great examples and descriptions on what those are doing and how to program those. Then we're going to set the phase of the phasers eight channels. And that phase is just going to be zero degrees because we're just going to have that array point straight ahead. And then we're going to set the gain of the phasers eight channels. And for this gain, I'm using a Blackman taper that helps with some of the side lobes. So you can check out some of the other videos on that wiki.analog page and learn about gain tapering. So we apply all of those gains to the phasers eight antennas. There's some other hardware switches that we need to set basically just to set some of the RF paths and the options on the phaser board. So we do that here, but let's not spend too much time thinking about those right now. Okay, so some of the key parameters now the sample rate for Pluto is 600 kilohertz. So that's a low sample rate, but you saw from the experiment that we just ran that we were only seeing about a 250 hertz frequency deviation. So 600 kilohertz is plenty in order to see that kind of frequency deviation. The center frequency, this is Pluto's LO frequency. It's 2.2 gigahertz. This is basically the IF frequency in our signal chain. So the receive and transmit LOs of Pluto are going to be set to 2.2 gigahertz. The signal frequency is the information that we're actually sending. For us, this is just a sine wave. 
but in other systems, this might be some kind of a coded signal or a frequency ramp or a frequency chirp. But we need to give it something. We can't just send it 2.2 gigahertz because on both the transmit and receive, we try to suppress that carrier because ultimately all we want is the data that that carrier possesses. So for our case, that data is 100 kilohertz. Num slices and FFT slices is used to do the waterfall plot. And now we're gonna configure all the parameters for Pluto. First the receive side and then the transmit side. So we configure sample rate, we configure the LO frequency, we say that we want two channels enabled, we configure the gain. And then on the transmit side, we give it that same center frequency. We also enable two channels, even though we're only using one of the channels. So we set that other channel to maximum attenuation. And the channel that we're using is channel one. So we set that to zero dB of attenuation. I'd mentioned in the last video that we're using the ADF 4159 ramping PLL. And that combined with the VCO allows us to generate frequency chirps, which we're gonna talk about in the next video. So we set the output frequency of the VCO that is controlled by the ADF 4159, 12.2 gigahertz. So 12.2 gigahertz minus the 2.2 gigahertz IF frequency that we just set for Pluto. That's what gives us our 10 gigahertz output signal. Next, we configure the data pattern to output that 100 kilohertz sine wave. And that becomes this IQ data here. And finally, we just send that data to Pluto with this uh, mysdr.tx command. Now, unfortunately, a good chunk of this program is all of these GUI settings, and it's kind of a necessary evil. We kind of have to use PyQT graph to do the waterfall plot because matplotlib is just very, very slow at doing a waterfall plot. So there's a big chunk of code in here that's just dedicated to the PyQT GUI. And it's unfortunate because it makes this whole script look a lot more complicated than it really is. So I would just recommend ignoring that for now. And if you really want to dig into it, it's all there. You can, you can take a look at it. It's not, it's not hard to understand, but there's just a lot of it. So we scroll through all of that. Okay. And then we get back into the good stuff. So first we grab a buffer of data from Pluto and that buffer of data is actually going to return two columns, one for receive one and one for receive two. We're going to add those together since we're doing a phased array implementation there. So we sum those together, we apply a window to the data. And then this code here is just calculating the DBFS of that data. So what is the magnitude of the data represented in decibels full scale? And then we just update the graphs with that data. And this repeats in an ongoing loop. It updates the top graph with the instantaneous FFT plot. And then the bottom graph, the waterfall plot, like a strip chart recorder. So that's it. That's the whole program. I hope that wasn't too scary or complicated. If this is your first time in Python or your first time using Pluto and some of ADI's products, probably the other video I mentioned is a better place to start where you focus just on Pluto and some of these commands and it'll make more sense. And then basically we're just adding a few more commands to control the RF pieces on Phaser in order to do this. But this is a very simple implementation of a CW radar system. Okay, so that was a very simple CW radar system. With an unmodulated sine wave, we can only get velocity. And really that velocity has to be something significant. But in the next video, we'll look at adding frequency modulation into the system. And that is when things really get interesting. And that kind of transmit modulation is really the foundation for most modern radar systems. So if that sounds interesting, then be sure to subscribe and look for that video soon. Thanks for watching.